Okay, so Harry, glad to see you, my friend, and great Likewise. to have you back on the show. Lots to talk about, so let's yeah. just jump right in. I'm ready. Let's start, let's start with this one. Trump's civil business fraud trial heard its closing arguments on Thursday. What can we learn from how Judge Ngoron did and did not manage Trump in the courtroom? It's a great question because I think he more did not and he really wanted to. I think we learned two things. The first thing we learn is I think he is focused on, everyone understands, including Trump, he's going to totally shellack him. But he's looking at the appellate review down the line. And when Trump jumps in after having been forbidden to do it, and Engeron starts to make sure he'll follow the rules, he, and he doesn't even listen, grabs the mic and starts going, most judges to most litigants would have said, sit down or, or tell the marshals to escort him out. Uh, but I think he's thinking he doesn't want to give him any excuse on appeal for saying he somehow was muzzled. That's the first thing we learn is that Angoran is thinking about the appeal. The second thing we learn is Trump is completely incorrigible. I mean, so I, I, I don't know if you feel this way as a lawyer, but after the day before when he said, okay, you, you can't do it, you would think that's it. But literally on the day of, he just jumps in front of his lawyer, takes the mic, before he would even agree to the conditions, just starts talking. I mean, there's no rule that he will actually um, uh, obey. You know, you've been in court. I've been in court. It's you, you don't dare do that kind of brazen disobedience, but Donald Trump does. So I think that's the second thing we learn. The third is just old, tired. We know what his campaign stump speech is because that's all he provided, nothing about the law, but that wasn't anything new. Well, he decided he was going to take a couple of pretty good swipes at me, you know, while... At you know, you, while at the, and you weren't even in the courtroom, also at the AG, also at Angoron, et cetera. Of, of course. You know, it's funny because yesterday I was on television with Laura Coates. And one she's of the great. questions that she, she's great. And one of the questions that she asked me was about that specific topic, which is, you know, about Donald's constant attacks upon me. And I put out this, I put out this statement on it that I have never seen Donald look so preoccupied. He has the face of a defeated man on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I mean, I don't know if you saw it in his face, but I know Donald. I know Donald very, very well. I sat by his side for over a decade, closer to a decade and a half. I mean, that's how long. So I know his tics. I know his facial expressions. He looks as my father or my grandmother, you know, a grandfather would say, he looks epispecac. Right. He looks yeah. like he looks like his like his whole fucking world is just crumbling beneath him. And then I said, it's why he blames everyone but himself for destroying his father's business, which is what he did. You know, there's that expression. What's the best way to have two billion? Start with four. Yeah. Right. That's right. what. Donald, but he doesn't even have that anymore. And no matter how many times that Alina Haba or Chris Kais or any of them regurgitate, you know, Donald's talking points, especially as it relates to denigrating me and trying to impugn my credibility. Here's why he looks epispecocked, why he looks so messed up, nervous and preoccupied. It's because he knows that the bill, that financial bill is coming and he can't afford to pay it. So that's the nervous face that Donald is showing. You raise a couple really good points and you know you're the expert at his at the very sort of, you know, gradations of what he looks like, but I got to say first just the fact that he was there, he wasn't trying to convince 
Engeron. I'm not even sure he was trying to convince the public. Just something somehow his, and I've long since given up, you know, trying to psychoanalyze Donald Trump, but he needed somehow to be there personally. And, and an obvious reason is because his mark was, you know, his, his brand, his life is sort of, you know, on the line and, and imperiled. But then second, your point about the lawyers is, so, you know, they, he gets away with everything, but um, because you're right, they did his bidding and it was the same in the, uh, with Sauer in the oral mm -hmm. argument where he, where Trump shows up and writes some notes and Sauer just says shit that wasn't true you know, lawyers are a little bit different. And I, you know, on the everything uh, Donald Trump touches die scale, they were willing to basically uh, commit a uh, you know, misconduct or, or things that could have got to get him in hot water with a court. Maybe it won't because there's, you know, so many other things to worry about where Donald Trump is concerned. But he even as corrupted, you know, I don't think of Alina Haba as a real professional, but Kai's maybe. And, um, uh, you know, that's that's among their worst professional moments, I think, are some of the things they've stood up and and said uh, represented to a court you know, on behalf of Donald Trump. You know what's amazing though is you may have seen in one of my tweets, or they call them tweets still, considering it's not Twitter. <laughs> right. it's, they call it it's not, on Twitter. I don't know. On X. Right. Otherwise, so, you have to, they're social, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. So I posted on Twitter, on X, this one thing. It really angers me every time that I see Donald Trump heading to court. So they, they go to the shot outside of Trump Tower, and there's an entire oh. slew of vehicles, like right. 15, 16 vehicles. Okay. And then all of a sudden you see, right. right? You see this piece of shit, this lard ass, walk out. There's no one fucking there, and he knows it because he's not blind, right? And he starts to do the wave to people who aren't yeah. there. Yeah. Gets into the car, and the sirens and the lights start going, and the procession goes out. Yeah. Now. Who's in that 16 car caravan? We got a bunch of New York City police. You have a fire truck. You have an EMT, right? You have a uh, you have an EMT vehicle as well. There's a whole bunch of suburbans, and in those suburbans, you have the lawyers. You have Alan Garten. You had Eric Trump. You had Boris Epstein. I mean, Boris it, Epstein, amazing. It, it I was, didn't do that. Right. He was there. Uh, yeah. He was there. And the funny part about it, and well, now it, I think, right? Yes, and yeah. a whole bunch of lawyers were there, but none of them say anything. They're there for what? It's all part of the show. It's like They're the palace guard. If you want to pretend to be a king, you need a palace guard. Right. You need your entourage. You right, know, right. it's like some people. You know, it's, he. It's so crazy to me that you have this entire entourage following him. None of them say anything. You got Alina Habba's wearing glasses the other day, right? You have uh, the other guy, Chris Kyes, on the other. And I don't understand what the fuck is up with Chris Kyes either. If I was Trump, I'd be really fucking pissed. And I'll tell you why. He's smiling all the time. What the hell are you smiling about? I stand to lose a minimum of $370 million, something that nobody has talked about so far. Let's assume that Tish James, that the judge makes the determination on the 370 as laid out by Tish James. Let's just assume that that number is. You know, let's for, just for safety's sake, let's just say 300. It's, I don't think it's okay. going to be any different for you, so but I, think say, they'll, so I don't think they'll give three, them everything. Yeah. All right, let's say 300. Yeah. Here's yeah. the crazy thing that people don't know. New York's statutory interest is 9% a year. That's $27 million a year. And if I'm not mistaken, this case goes back six years. You know, you're talking about close to $200 million. Uh, so it's not $300. Yeah, it's people don't know that. And that doesn't include penalty. It just that's just that's just the interest. There's penalties uh, that go alongside that as well. So and well, the inability to to work going forward. 
Can I ask you a New York practice question? I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm hearing different things about whether it will be required or not for an appeal for him to post a, a killer bond. He will have to post a bond, and the bond equal? is yeah. equal to the judgment. And again, when you think he doesn't have that kind of money, right? No, he does not. Um, even and if, if he can't, can't post it, that's the end of the case. If you can't post it, then you can't. What do you call it? Then you can't file the appeal. Yeah. What, okay. What's fantastic here, though, is Tish James already anticipated. Donald Trump's next move, which was to try to sell, hypothecate, transfer the assets, the New York assets yeah. to a corporation domiciled outside of New York. Thereby, yeah. if he loses um, and they suspend or they terminate his standing uh, on the license for the Trump Corp, well, he'll have the other company. But what do they do? They try to open up a company in Delaware. And not too intelligently, they try to name it Trump Corp 2. Well, she gets wind of this. And that's when they have a court ordered, they have a, they have a court uh, receiver appointed. I think Tiffany maybe did that name, huh? Okay. No, nah, Tiffany's smarter <laughs> yeah. than that. So yeah. I can right. tell you, I can tell you. A court order receiver. Oh, actually, this is all news to me. I'm sure to your your listeners as well. So yeah. So uh, there is a receiver. What, what happened? Yeah. There yep. is a receiver, and I talked about this a long time ago. So let's assume that you and I, Harry, are correct. The number is going to ultimately be with penalties and interest, five hundred million dollars. Wow. Okay, a lot of people say, yeah, but he's a mega billionaire. He could pay it. I mean, I remember when Steve Cohn, who's the owner of the Mets, had an um, an issue, and he had just shy of a billion dollar penalty and a fine. He stroked the check. Why? Because he's fucking rich, really rich, but with real money. Right. With Donald, they're going to have to sell assets. So where do you start? Well, he has assets here in New York whether it's apartments in various buildings, uh, commercial space. But let's start with something like 40 Wall Street, 1.2 million square feet. What's it worth? He'll say it's worth, as he did, five, six hundred million dollars. It's not. Right. Let's say it's worth 200 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, still worth a lot of money. Certainly a lot more than, than I have, especially now. His basis in that property is $1 oh, million, right. not to mention he's taken depreciation. So not only do you have a right. non-existent basis, but you also have recapture. He will ultimately have to pay city, state, and federal tax on the sale of that property. So even assuming he gets the $200 million clean, no brokerage fees, no nothing, He's only going to walk away with, at best, $100 million. Okay, no, that's 20% so far of the amount. Let's go to the next asset. And this is what's going to happen. His basis in the bulk of these assets are extremely low, almost to the point of non-existent, including his triplex apartment. He has no basis in it because he took it. He took it instead of taking profit from the sale going back into the 90s. He took it and deferred all of the, you know, all of the, the tax implication on it. So that's going to get wiped out. All right. Let me and let me interject first. Let me I know you have a very sophisticated uh, listening audience, but just for the some who don't. So the basis here would be what he paid originally. And then they uh, you got to pay the piper when down the line you have a, an appreciated property. And of course, if you depreciate it, but, you know, so it's a really good point that that, you know, there's going to be a real tax hit. But what makes you think? I don't I mean, I don't know how to put it, but it, but last week, as I was saying, well, of course, the judge has ordered that he can't do it. So at this point, Donald Trump can't do it. And then surprise, he grabs the mic and does it. What's what if his strategy is sort of Rudy Giuliani-esque of just like saying, 
I won't, I won't pay it and just, uh, you know, they will have they people will attached and will try to try to flee the jury. You know, can't do you actually? You're saying this as if now it's t- it will be time to pay the piper. The day of reckoning will have come. Do you believe uh, that that the law will triumph in this sense over Donald Trump? Sure, because the attorney general will have a judgment, yeah. mm-hmm. and. It's not like you have to domesticate the judgment because the judgment is in New York. So any yep. asset that is in the names of any of the defendants, joint and several, yep. you can go and attach those assets. So she just go the next day and and the uh, next here's, day. Here's and there's, clean, there's, whoever, yeah. Okay. Yes. And there's already <laughs> an appointed receiver over these assets. And so what she'll do is she'll have the receiver, which is why he's put into the position. I see. That's not an aspect that was that's up on appeal now. There is a receiver in place. There is a receiver in I, place. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, all right, let me move on. So I've now given yeah, you some new fodder to talk about when you're on TV. <laughs> and, and, right. But, Thank you. So Trump was in the appeals court on Tuesday trying to convince the three-judge panel that he is immune to prosecution while president. How do you see that panel ruling? And do you think it'll be kicked up to the Supreme Court if and when they rule against him? So the first question is really easy and there's no um, there's no if to it. Um, they will rule against him. Uh, it, it already was a very tenuous claim because it goes right to the heart of, you know, the rule of law and who we are as a democracy. But then back to the lawyering, they chose a line of defense that was just, you know, stupid, torpedoed out of the water in, in many ways. But, there, you know, this one really Perry Mason-ish moment when a new, when a Biden appointed judge Actually, someone I've known for many years, she's a really good judge, Pan, um, did this hypothetical. So you're saying then that he could just uh, use the Navy SEAL to assassinate the opponent. And literally, this guy, this genius's response was, uh, yes, right, unless he's impeached and convicted first. So in eight different ways, you know, logically – Legally, politically, it, it you know he was a dead man walking. So he th- they will lose on immunity now. So that's the first one I feel confident about. That we'll go to the Supreme Court. Um, it depends, I think, on how he loses. And they have the the one thing that made made me a little nervous as I was listening to it in real time is the three judges were sort of um, pushing on different theories for how to affirm, how to say he lacks immunity. And I think there are, without getting too um, down in the legal weeds, I think there are some things they could say that would make it more likely and some things that would make it less likely that the Supreme Court uh, might want to get involved. Remember, they have the, two, two points to make about the Supreme Court. They want, in the worst way, if they can, I mean, six or seven of them, you know, leave aside the kind of uh, rebels on the far right, Alito and Thomas, but they want, in the worst way, not to be seen as being responsible for what happens in the election. That's point one. And point two, they have this other case that they are going to hear February 8th, where, you know, it's it's uh, they can't avoid it. It's coming at them like a freight train. They've taken it, so they're already going to be um, meddling in, if you want to put it that way, But if, um, the election. So if they could dodge this one, I think they happily would. But it probably has a fair bit to do. You know, it is, a, it is an important question that's never been decided by the Supreme Court. So would they, you know, let it go? I think it depend a lot on how, um, A, is it unanimous? There was some sense that the Republican appointee might be going a little bit different. And is it a pretty sort of, as this thing, as these things go, not too broad a pronouncement, the kind of thing they can, you know, let go for another day. So I, I, it, it'll have a lot to do with how it is decided. And I think it's going to be decided, by the way, quite quickly. I think by Friday, we're going to get the opinion. I mean, I, again, 
you don't that's you don't have a right to just be heard by the Supreme Court. It's a writ sure. of certiorari. You make an application for yeah. the Supreme Court to hear this specific case. That's and right. as I sat and I reviewed this and I listened to the argument that Trump's lawyers were trying to make, I mean, when John Sauer turned around and said a qualified yes, First of all, I don't even know what that means. And I it means he doesn't extensive... answer the question. Yeah. Right. I mean, I have a right. pretty extensive vocabulary. I have never <laughs> in my life heard anybody talk about a qualified yes. You know, it, it to me. So it, a yes or no question from the court, right? Start <laughs> with yes and go from there, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and what he really meant, by the way, was no. That's his quali what's a qualified yes actually meant there. I mean, could you yeah. imagine the question asked to you is whether or not that a president can call up SEAL Team 6, which, by the way, is the elite squad that right. is contacted they get the job when done. you want yeah. – they get the job done like yeah. Osama bin Laden. That's, That's right. SEAL Team 6. Right. SEAL Team 6 is not authorized to go against a United States citizen to kill because they are an enemy of the president unless they are a threat to national security or to America. I mean, he wants to use them as his own personal goon squad. And this guy, John Sauer, did not even have the, the brains, the seichel here to turn around and to say, yeah. wait, 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 of course he can't do that. So my question that I'm trying I to get from yeah, you, but the yeah. question I'm trying yeah. to get out of you is this, if it gets kicked up to the Supreme Court, will they even hear this as a case? They don't right. have to accept the writ. They, they can just reject to. it and say there is not a legal argument to be presented to the Supreme Court that we – could or even should be reviewing the decision. Except there is. It's just not the one he uh, he made. I got caught flat-footed, actually. On uh, I I never got I never feel a question like this. I don't know if you did, but I was on Chris Hayes. He just said, Tell, "Rate the lawyering there," and you know, sort of sentence by sentence, Sauer hung in there. But his his initial choice, his strategy to take that line was so um, foolish and and you know doomed to, to to fail. So that's what I mean though, Michael, about how they decide. If so, they will not decide for him and and just reject on that line. That line is gone. They'll hold and that would be a line of very broad immunity. They'll they'll hold no immunity. Um, but will they do it in a way that is just um, um, you know, relatively contained, so the court knows that Trump will be convicted. I, I do think they that that would be if they could wave a, a wand. That would be their desire, or you know that that um, I, they're not looking, in other words, to shield him. But if if it could um, uh, happen without damage to the law. So it, I 100% I agree they would love it if they could not only deny it, but deny it really quickly. Or if they do it really well, they could do what's called su summary affirmance. You just, you know, issue an order, boom, we it's now Supreme Court precedent. But it's going to matter how the Court of Appeals writes the opinion. And if the court feels it's wrong... And, you know, it's going to matter over the course of the next, you know, for Trump in, in, in this year. There's, there'll certainly be some votes, let me mm -hmm. put it that way, to, to, to take the case and maybe dissent. The kind of, if they don't, the kind of thing that Roberts cares about. So, yeah, they, look, they have another case up there that could affect things. The, the uh, obstruction case with one of the marauders they, and they have this Colorado 14th Amendment case. So if they could punt on this one, I, I, I agree that they would uh, happily do so. But we, but we'll, we'll really have to see the opinion to know if they can. I think. So, Harry, let me then ask you this: Do you expect that Trump's federal election fraud case will get underway 
anywhere near the March 4th start date that Judge Chutkin set. And this it's the, the most important thing to happen that could happen. I think we're I think just this little uh, frolic and detours couple months. And my real worry is they do an opinion now that goes back to her and she um, applies it and then he gets another round. So um, it, I think in the overall scheme of things, you could, you know, is 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 soon to March 4th mean. So there's plenty of time to get a jury and a, uh, and a conviction before November or does soon mean, you know, really proximate. I think, I think we've lost two months. Of, we will have lost two months at a minimum. And it, I'm going to really be looking carefully at the opinion when it comes out because he's going to lose. Everyone knows that. And it was kind of, reassuring to hear and it was it was um uh impressive how the one judge totally uh you know shredded sour but the and this is the one way he can delay after this it's in chutkin's mm-hmm. courtroom and she's a good manager of time she you know she'll really have her eye on the clock so this is the big risk it's already i think we're talking you know june could be July. If it goes to August, it starts to get pretty funky, doesn't it? So um, it does. Yeah, yeah. But you know the the problem for Trump and something that I know that they know because you could see based upon the statements that he makes about me uh, that you get Chris Kais, Alina Haba, every one of the Trump lawyers, you know, attacking me, my credibility, etc. Because if the March fourth case gets postponed till July, that's not going to prevent the Alvin Alvin, Bragg Right, which is the Michael Cohen case. That's right. It's the state criminal case, something that he can't pardon himself on either. So that's not a difficult case to prove. It happens to be out of, let's say, the four cases that Trump has been indicted on. It is the least repulsive of the four. Clearly, still illegal, but it doesn't hold a candle to attempting to overturn a free and fair election. It ha- doesn't. Right. It doesn't hold a candle to a insurrection, right? It doesn't hold a candle to failure to return top secret documents, and and so it doesn't. So this is the least offensive of the crimes that Trump has been indicted on. But nevertheless, yeah. it is still a crime. It's also an easy case. I think the entire Alvin Bray case starts and finishes within 45 days because you don't have that many witnesses. There's not that many documents, maybe a couple of hundred at most. You can knock that shit out in a month. And then yeah, no, I, would have, I would have thought even less. Everything you say is right, and including you know your very very central role there. You'll know, they'll cross examine you for a few days, but um, uh, it's you know I, it, I mean it's stunning what you say, but it, but clearly true that this is the least problematic. The guy wasn't just you know paying off a, a foreign star to keep it secret, but he was doing it to affect the election. It clearly is an election-driven case to try to hoodwink the voters. That's not small potatoes. I certainly have a piece with his other other um, distortions and corruptions of the electoral process. And yet, relative to the other three, it's small enough that you kind of worry that, you know, people will, A, think, oh, whatever, and B, right. oh, this, you know, another criminal case? Wait, so... Um, and Alvin Bragg's been a real gentleman, if that's the right word, saying, you know, he'll 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 be second, he'll be third, whatever. But as you say, the other cases are of the of themselves getting knocked back in different ways. Mm-hmm. And that does leave it here it is, May. Bragg's ready to go, the judge is ready to go. You know, it could well it could well come first. I'll be honest, I'm not sure I'm ready to go. Be right, very honest right, with you. Yeah, I really yeah. have very little interest in, you know, even I being know. involved in this shit. You know, I mean, my life has been beaten, my, you know, again and again and again by this maniac. But, 
you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. I do. He also, always needs an enemy. He always needs to vilify someone and somebody. You're, you're, you're his pick for this trout. Yeah. Yeah. So. Have you ever wished that you had a whiter and a brighter smile? Well, before you visit a dentist, you should know that their whitening treatments can be very expensive. And it's not just the price. You also have to book the appointment and schedule time away from work or family to sit in a dentist's office chair while undergoing the procedure. I mean, let's be honest, it's a hassle. Fortunately, now you can try Smile Actives at home or anywhere, anytime. Smile Actives offers a safe and an affordable alternative to those expensive whitening processes. Like most people, I'm a big coffee drinker. I drink a ton of coffee. And over time, I've noticed that my teeth have lost some of their brightness that I was originally used to seeing. 97% of Smile Active users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average, all within 30 days. I'm using it. Look. I mean, simply add Smile Active Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into your teeth's grooves and crannies so that you get better whitening. Smile Actives makes a teeth whitening gel that can simply be added to your toothpaste every time that you brush your teeth. So no change in your routine, no extra time, and no more messy strips, trays, or lights. People will start commenting on your whiter, your brighter smile in just days. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile that you deserve. So I want you all right now to visit smileactives.com forward slash Cohen today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery plus free shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash Cohen. Terms and conditions apply. So see the site for details. Well, the Supreme Court will probably end up ruling on whether or not Trump can be barred from the ballot because yeah. of the insurrection, because he incited the January 6th insurrection. How do you see the high court ruling on this issue? I mean, there's so many issues that are now going to be going to the Supreme Court. Uh, I have one myself, which I'll talk about after you answer this extremely important question. But how do you see the high court ruling? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen or, or even studied a case that is on the one hand of so politically momentous and on the other hand, so legally uh, unprecedented. They've got really nothing to wor work with. Um, and I I think I, 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 have a, I have a strong suspicion how it will come out. But when you go through, I actually wrote a couple of op-eds in the last couple of days, one that says, I think. This is how it'll come out. But going through the different ways it could come out that way, none of, none of them is pretty. Um, but I, I think the number one uh, concern for the court will be that there's not a patchwork pattern uh, in in the state. So it, so that it, it's not the case that he's not on in Colorado and Maine, but he's on everywhere else, et cetera. And there's, if you want one consistent federal solution, you can't um, uh, bounce him from the ballot everywhere um, because they, they, among other things, they don't have uh, the facts for it. They have facts of what Colorado found, but they, you would need a whole sort of federal trial to work its way uh, up. Plus, it would be the clearest example of the very thing they want to avoid, being responsible for the election outcome. So I think they're going to rule. Uh, I think they're going to reverse the Colorado Supreme Court, but they need to do it. They can't just say, oh, you used uh, a too um, broad definition of insurrection because another state can then say, OK, thanks very much and use a narrower one and get to mm -hmm. the same result. They need to shut it down. So they need to state uh, a holding of federal constitutional law that means no state can go forward. And, you know, there's a there's like six candidates. They're all kind of lousy. But I think um, either saying, you know, and it's really just would scarcely be credible. But either saying 
the thing that the trial court in Colorado said, he's not an off, the president isn't an officer or saying something like Congress has to be the one that decides. Uh, and that's sort of part of the, of section three of the 14th amendment. Again, not so pretty because we know it's not part of section one of the 14th amendment, but anyway, that's what I see them doing. But what a, what a, Challenge but, Harry, if case. they kick it back to Congress, yeah, it's very similar to the case that I brought against the United States government for the unconstitutional remand of me back to prison because I refused to waive my First Amendment constitutional right. So you know that I went to the Second Circuit, three three judge panel as well, and I'm blown away when I saw the decision because there was at least one judge that attacked government, literally slapped himself, you could hear it in the recording, slapped himself on the head and say, what is the deterrence to mm -hmm. a yeah. the next president or to yeah. anyone to stop them from remanding somebody to prison? Or he said, killing them in the street, which is exactly what Donald Trump is talking about with, no, you know, right. with his, yeah. with John Sauer, when they say that they would just have SEAL Team 6 come and execute you. And the deterrence right. that government said was, well, the first is there are Bureau of Prison, um, uh, there, there, it's like a BP-8, a 9, a 10, 11, 12, these administrative, so, yeah. administrative remedies that, right. and he was like, stop it. Those take years <laughs> before which you can even file a, a, an action, you know, to, to get yourself out under a writ of habeas corpus. But then she said, well, another thing is like what Mr. Cohen did, and he availed himself to a writ of habeas corpus proceeding, and the judge determined that the remand was improper, and so they could then use his decision as precedent. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So they get thrown into prison, and the only way that you get out is you use the precedented case of Mr. Cohen and the whole thing. Meanwhile, none of them turned around and dissented in my case. We're now going to go to the Supreme Court. Everybody so well, far from you Judge Is that what you're saying? What's that? They held against you 3-0? 3-0. And, and who wrote? Who wrote? Uh, I forget. I forget the presiding okay. judge. It was a it was a a, 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 a female. Uh, the presiding judge. I forget. Okay. But all I can say is, it's now we're going to go to the Supreme Court. And again, we hope that they take up this case because there are reasons. What they're all saying, Judge um, Lyman, what these three panel judges as well said. In order for you to get your remedy, you have to get the remedy from Congress. The fuck can anybody get anything from Congress? They can't even pass a budget. They can't get along long enough in order to get anything passed. I mean, it's to me, it's it's a real problem. I mean, you know, there the division between the Republican members of Congress and the Democratic members of Congress is so wide and expansive that there's no way that either side will be able to get anything and that's now, why if there's divided like, control right i mean we learned that in the impeachment but uh, and of course the other but there's a flip side problem here which is let's say they say it's up to congress and let's say the dems take the house you know now it's january 3rd before he's sworn in so that have they just said that a majority vote in each house outs him as president so that's a loaded gun lying around they, you know they've got to be really thoughtful and careful about what they they do here and try as much as possible to have a united seeming court not the, the eyesore of a bush v gore divided especially along partisan lines this is uh, it's, it's a case for the ages i'm gonna i'm gonna go to the oral argument I'm really looking forward to it well actually i'd like you to write an amicus if you can but let me then <laughs> yeah if if you can so in your honest opinion harry does the right wing majority of the high court really want trump to become president again i mean won't a second trump opinion. term yeah, right. right, but won't a second Trump term 
threaten the very existence of the court? And not because I'm asking the great Harry Littman this question, but because Donald said so. I, how many times have people heard me say, don't I listen know. to me or Harry or anybody else. Listen to it. If you want to know about Donald Trump, listen to him. Ask him. He'll tell you. He wants to rewrite the Constitution. He wants to terminate the tripartite system of government. I talk about it on almost every podcast. He wants to get rid of the legislative branch as well as the judiciary and confer all power to himself. That means there is no more Supreme Court. There's no more well, Supreme Court because you won't yeah. need it. So what I look, are they I think doing? Your point's really well taken. Yeah, you know, two of these guys were clerks, and with I mean, I you know, I knew Gorsuch and Kavanaugh pretty well, and then some of the others. I, I'm confident in the answer here. They don't want him. He is so much trouble. Uh, even even from a sort of parochial, just thinking about themselves point of view, that the the headaches that he gives them, but and and the pressure that he puts on them from all his semi-constitutional to, to flagrantly unconstitutional maneuvers, they would, if they could, like as so many of us would, you know, uh, take a magic wand and make this a Trumpless um, country. So I, yeah, he's, and he's, it's funny. I mean, this is what life tenure is about, right? He's out there saying, you know, I know that Brett Kavanaugh, I, I went mm -hmm. to the mat for him. As if like, you know, I mean, just think about Payback. it for a second. What it's he's Payback. thinking is like, yeah, it's like, no, but he's thinking like Brett Kavanaugh's there. He, he wasn't going to do this yet. But now since Trump says it in public, oh, right, that's right. He did all this work for me. I guess I really better now, you know, even though he's got life uh, tenure. He's, he's, um, no, he, he's more than worn out as welcome, even for people whom he gave the dream of their lifetime, the opportunity to serve on the Supreme Court. If if they could be done with him and have the country done with him, I feel confident they would. Yeah, well, I'm not 100 percent certain. You know, I mean, yeah. this Supreme that Court. That doesn't mean that because now there's rulings and now, you know, they have to worry about the law. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they're in there as as they clearly were in Bush versus Gore to figure out a way for so-and-so to win. I think they're thinking what you could call politically in the sense of the results and and how it will play out going forward more than you know applying the law step by step. But I don't think they're going to be acting politically in the sense of 6-1 Trump and 3-1 Biden. You know, it's funny because I've had a whole slew of constitutional law professors reach out to me, ask me if I would come and meet with their class and speak to them oh, because they're yeah. actually teaching. You're the man. Yeah, that, well, right. not particularly. I mean, I, listen, I, yeah, my, my case is going to certainly survive long after I'm gone, but they've actually almost compared it to like Brown versus Board of Education uh, or Plessy versus Ferguson. I am the first political prisoner held by my own country because I refuse to waive my First Amendment constitutional right. That is the entire essence of democracy. The fact that Harry Littman can go on television, he could write an article critical of the President of the United States, of American leaders. Well, not according to Donald Trump. And if, Harry, you do, like what Putin would do, like what Putin has done to Navalny and others, they either or like what was like what happened to unfortunately um, what which uh, 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 Khashoggi uh, Jamal Khashoggi they just take you apart into pieces. Well, what's the difference? They ended up remanding me back to prison because I refused to waive my constitutional right. How can how can Second Circuit have come up with the decision that they have. I don't care about the fact that the Dobbs decision overturned the Bivens case, which was the precedented case that you use to bring in action for um, restitution against somebody that violates the government, that violates your constitutional right. In the um, Edbert case, it clearly states, and it was Justice Thomas that said it, unless it is of the most unusual circumstance. So 
thankful to have the brilliant Harry Littman in front of me here. <laughs> My question to you is, can you name a scenario that would be more unusual of a circumstance than the President of the United States with a willing and complicit Attorney General weaponizing the Department of Justice to go against a critic. And I bring this up, and I went after this case for several reasons. One, because it needs to be known, especially before the election. But for a second reason, my biggest fear is that what he did to me, he will do to you and to every one of my listeners that somehow comes into contact with him or his brown shirts because it's no different than like what Stalin did. Somebody rats on you, next thing you know, SEAL Team 6 comes to your house, pulls you out, begs you, tags you, and as Trump said, we'll just ship your ass to Guantanamo or kill you. Yeah. Um, well, look, I, you know, most unusual, well, there was things like that that Nixon did, but most pernicious – uh, and again, you know, I don't I don't haven't read the Second Circuit opinion. I don't know the exact facts, but he's promised in manifold ways to do exactly this and to use the not just to use the law, but to mow the law down in order to have direct lines of attack on his political enemies. That's the, the very definition of a puppet banana republic. I mean, you know, he it's a real you, it's a really serious State, uh, state of affairs, you can't, as I guess a long time ago people did, dismiss him as a buffoon. We are talking, I think, clearly about an assault on the Constitution and the potential end of the American experiment. People use these words in alarmist ways, but, you know, the history, uh, I think, does show that mm -hmm. democracies are not you, they're not guaranteed to to um, stick around, and once they begin to erode and go over the line, they don't they don't snap back, or at no. least uh, that you know you, you can't count on it. So I don't think the um, the stakes in my lifetime, anyway, and I'm trying even maybe you know maybe 1860 whatever, but I don't think the stakes could be more grave. And what you're talking about is you know we don't have to take your word for it. He's He's promising himself. He's so, going to use all the law to do one. You know, the, the mission of the United States will be to go after the enemies, foreign and domestic, but especially domestic, of Donald Trump. What more do you have to know? And how the hell is it that uh, you know he he is a credible presidential candidate? I right. you know mind boggling. Mind -boggling. So yeah. Harry, how can we, for example, hold the insurrectionists? still in Congress. How do we hold them accountable? Yeah. You know, people forget about that. Yeah, there's 2,000 people that are being put through the criminal justice system who attacked the Capitol on January 6th. And each one of them should be held accountable for their actions. But not one member of Congress, not one person, and we have emails, we have text messages, we have communications, there's video of them like showing people around the Capitol so that they had a map. I mean, why should they be allowed to have their names on whatever ballots when they were part of the coup to overthrow our government? I mean, look, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. I'm not trying to be over-exaggerative. I'm a realist. These fuckers helped a bunch of other fuckers try to overthrow our government. And in that overthrow attempt, wanted to hang Mike Pence, execute Nancy Pelosi and others, and yet they're still allowed to vote. They still have not been held accountable. What do we do? It is a Great point. There's one who's gotten a little bit closer, Scott Perry, who is deeply involved, a sort of personal actor in the whole DOJ scheme uh, part of this. But otherwise, you're right. There's a whole world of them, and we know it. Uh, I, I think it's a little caught up in what happens with Mark Meadows, who is trying one last great escape 
and and has you know hired another excellent uh, lawyer but down in Fulton County. But he, in the days up to, was absolutely we we know in touch with all kinds of members of Congress who were if it's if. If it's if it's true that it's a the conspiracy that's been charged, and if to you know all you have to do is is um, agree to the unlawful objective and do one overt act, I really do think you have many members who um, at least ought to be deeply investigated for crimes. And if you're going to really do full accountability, you need to go there. Now I can imagine it either way. I can imagine a scenario. Where DOJ just, you know, this is the worst uh, crime in the sense, political crime in American history. So they keep on going to, to you know, 2030, literally. Uh, they'll, they'll be going for a while on the appeals, et cetera, with that stuff. And I can imagine a state of affairs where it's like, you know, some kind of national right, not fatigue one, policy. Not one decision. member, Harry, not one member of Congress has been you're indicted preaching, on any of them. To the choir. We have their emails. We have their start with emails. Scott Perry. Right. You're preaching to the choir. It's, it's yeah, they really should. Now it's a whole. Now let me tell you, from having been inside DOJ, many different procedural hurdles, you know, et cetera. And it wouldn't be it wouldn't be Jack Smith. It'd be a different operation. But um, yeah, it's if what Mark Meadows did was wrong, you know, if if what the uh, Eastman and Ted were well, they were working literally with members of Congress, and yeah, it's it they should not get Jamie off scot free. And at a minimum, at minimum, there's two there's two points here. It's not just criminal, uh, you know, facing the music. There's knowledge our historical accountability we don't even know sort of the full story and everything we do learn makes it look worse and worse mm -hmm. so yeah i i can just say you can imagine you, know, you can imagine this being another 10 years and you can imagine not so yeah so i hate to even ask this of you harry but republicans uh, are gearing up to try and impeach president biden yeah my question to you is how on what grounds? I mean, thus far, they've produced zero evidence other than a dick pic of Hunter Biden. All of these wild allegations of money floating around, all of these allegations of um, uh, pay for play kind of sounds a lot like the Trump administration. Have I missed something? What What's yeah. happening here? Yeah, I mean, there aren't even allegations that if they were true, you know, it's like maybe stuff he did as vice president. It, it, you know, it is there's not a credible constitutional scholar of any political stripe who would say there's anything here. But, uh, you know, in, impeachment, it's really been devalued since what I thought was the itself a constitutional hijacking of 1998 with impeaching. Um, Clinton. So it's just what's going on. You have, you could see this in the votes themselves. Um, you know, political officials think politically some, but you've got, you expect that they have, you know, a small measure of um, respect for or um, you know, a duty towards broader constitutional values and a big part of the, the lessons of the last fucking, not just the last several years, but today uh, is that there's zero, not even a modicum. So the why, why or how, because they can, if they can, no other reason, no other reason. And that's a stunning uh, state of affairs, but there's, you know, n no credible argument that would that would go, you know, within a country mile of a valid impeachment. Of course, we, we've learned this over the last, uh, you know, a uh, few years with Trump, high crimes and misdemeanors for Congress to decide all true, but all true with the um, understanding and assumption that you have uh, political officials with some sense of public duty, some sense of 
the constitution to which they've sworn an oath. And on the an- the short answer to your <laughs> question is they have no sense. That's Harry, how about, how about that's Trump turning around right. saying, how about Trump turning around saying that he did not swear or pledge an oath to the constitution? I mean, to, I mean how about just yeah. play him back, play him back when he put his hand on the Bible during inauguration and he pledges to uphold the, the constitution. Look, that's why, I, I that's why he can't testify. I'm saying, all right, you can always play it back. Oh, really? Well, what about, and let's just take a couple days and go over the more flagrant, easily provable lies. That's, you know, that's right. Such a, such a stunning rogue. Um, but you were once under his thrall, and now a lot of people are. It, it's so hard to account for. Obviously, I'm, you know, live in a hopelessly liberal enclave where, you know, but it's, it, it feels to me like, okay, already, whatever policy reason you might have had at the time, it's just clear beyond any kind of, of speculation. This is one dangerous mofo and, and how anyone could take the risk of having him again uh, in control of, of the levers of government is, I, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm talking down there, is, is for me a little bo- mind boggling, but also just like poignant. You know, that I, it's, it's stunning that, that this is right now, by many people's measures, a jump ball. It, you know, it's just stunning. It, it is. You know, it's actually, I had this other question I want to ask you, you know, now that Chris Christie has jumped uh, and dropped yeah. out of the GOP race, right? Um, do you think that that will help Nikki Haley? Or do you think that even with that, she's going to get smoked by Trump, which goes into the whole point that you're making? Yeah. How is it that there are all these people? that are no. still following him. I personally don't believe it. And you've heard me a thousand times talk about polls. I don't believe any of that shit. I yes. saw Joe Biden on television talking about Donald Trump just the other day. And what a great delivery. What a great speech that he made. The funniest thing is that Trump comes out and he makes fun of Biden's speech talking about how he's basically just reading it off a teleprompter, that he doesn't even know where he is or what he's talking about. Yet Trump reads off a teleprompter too. And, you know, the funny thing is it's when he goes off script is when he puts his, you know, his little foot in his big fucking mouth. Yeah. As we learned about January 6th itself, right? That teleprompter. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to say it's, it's all um, decided. Look, what there's there is some real I really agree with you. There's some real learning to be done. We just don't understand right now what polls show and what they don't. But I'm increasingly persuaded that, you know, there there are just reasons why there's uh, a distorted negative view of Biden. For one, I think it's a sour electorate and sort of whatever it is, they're against it. That's, you know, that's part of it. And then a lot of interesting stuff about who is captured and who isn't. But yeah, I think uh, I think the the polls um, are really suspect. On the other hand, you know, statistics is scientifically based, and I don't and I don't want to be um, uh, distorted in my thinking because I have you know a personal uh, preference. So there's there's a mess there to figure out later, and you have to hope that the way it uh, comes clear is that it's it's been wildly overstating of at least the percentage of Trump's uh, influence. It's clear that there is a group, a serious group. What's yeah. the least it could be? 20% this- that is just, you know, tonight they'll or they'll come out um, for Iowa in the snow. You know, he has certain ardent supporters. That's a, something to analyze in and of itself. But the breadth, yeah. really? Well, that's what we're... Which is amazing because even with the... Sure, but what's amazing is even with this voluminous set of legal issues, it's just not hurting him in the Republican primaries. I think the general election, he's going to get smoked based upon all this, right? And imagine with fewer of the guilty verdicts, right? My understanding is that that will ultimately change the mind of many of the Republican voters that is still on the fence. But right now, I still believe that there are more of us 
than there are of yeah. them. And I have to believe that. But Harry, as the well, hour let me just say comes- one quick thing. Yeah. I know because it goes so quickly. But we did I just taped a podcast just before this, and and three very credible people you know said, Well, why do we think that? The polls say it. And you know what? I don't believe the polls either. It's and who? maybe he's convicted and it doesn't it doesn't change. Who who the hell knows? But you're right, always a quick hour, Michael. Good right, to but be I with have you so again. I have one last question yeah. for you. Okay. As we get into the election, do you see abortion being the linchpin issue that Democrats are hoping it's going to be? And do you think that voters losing abortion rights will translate into votes for President Biden? I have said over and over and over again, when you lose a right, you've just said it as well, it's nearly impossible to ever get it back. It's why I brought that lawsuit, Michael Cohen versus the United States, Donald Trump, Bill Barr. They violated my First Amendment constitutional right. It's something that I see a, a, God forbid, a Trump president or a Trump-like president doing, making state-run media. And anybody that goes against it, well, again, I have SEAL Team 6 to take care of you. What do you think? I, I, I'll say a linchpin issue was really dominant in 2022. I think it'll really matter. And, you know, the stories that you continue to hear, and it's not just Trump, but the whole Republican Party, the way they would really just, you know, completely treat um, women like chattel. I think, I hope that uh, democracy itself uh, is a a really, really big issue. And it does look like the White House wants to play it that way. Biden in his first sort of official days on the campaign trail is sounding that refrain a lot too. So I think it will um, matter, but it really was pivotal in 2022. And, and, um, you know, I, I, I know it certainly won't be more than that would be my uneducated opinion. You know, but think about it, too. When Biden gave that speech, what was that speech really about? It's really the essence of our entire hour-long conversation. It's democracy over autocracy. And I don't understand, and I am baffled and perplexed, that there are Americans who would rather be led, who would rather see America become an autocracy than to continue this great experiment of democracy without even realizing- That works for me. Right. Uh, You know, I'm I'm all in on that theme. Without even even understanding, because so many of them are, you know, people who I know that they make- statements that, again, they, I I become dumbfounded. You do realize that a Trump autocracy, a Trump kingdom, what chance does some, a country like Israel have if you have Trump as the king, the dictator, the monarch, the Fuhrer, whatever, the supreme leader, whatever you want to call them, what chance does Israel have? When he turned around and he said, I can resolve the Israel-Hamas war, all that's about is who's going to pay him. It wouldn't have happened if I were president. Who's going to pay him the most money? That's what it's going to be. When he made the comment about he could have ended the civil war in 24 hours, we all know what that means. He would have not done what Abraham Lincoln did with an emancipation proclamation, but rather would have just turned around and said, okay, you know, how do I financially benefit from keeping slavery going? That's who he is, the same, as I say all the time, racist, sexist, misogynistic, xenophobic, homophobic, Islamophobic, anti-Semite. Everybody that falls within those categories, you got something to worry about. Well... I'm worried uh, to the extent I do and even don't fall in those categories. And I'm worried for my children. I'm worried. So, you know, um, um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be in there fighting for that theme as a, as a journalist. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm all in. 
Well, Harry, always good to see you, my friend. You too. Definitely going to need it. There's a lot more shit that's coming down the pike, so I'm going to need the yeah. great Harry Littman back <laughs> here on Maya Culpa. So thank All you right, for joining man. me, my brother. Always a pleasure. See you later. You got it.